This morning is October 19th and we are live every Thursday morning. We have a great show ahead of us. Later on we'll be talking with um, Francis Lorenz and um, Carlos Ortiz. I'm here to talk about the Day of the Dead celebration. Can't wait to get into that and to hear what they have in store. And then our sister's house is here. Kelly and Kai are here to talk about what's going on at our sister's house. And then Pierce County Coalition for Developmental Disabilities will be in the house. Tanika and Beth Ann are here to talk about some of the ongoing activities that you want to be aware of. And right now, let's go to Lauren, who has our pet of the week. Lauren, who is this that needs a forever home? This here is Greta. Oh. Um, she is a wonderful, wonderful pup. She's she's a youngster. She's definitely under like three years old. Oops, she's getting a little scared of the camera. That's but okay, I'm scared see, of the camera too. You can see that she is just stunning. This girl, she's ready to go for a hike. She's ready to go for a drive. She's ready to find a family of her own. She is precious. So um, when we think about a home for Greta, slow, gentle introductions. Always slow, gentle introductions with any pets, um, whether it be Greta. Oh, good sit. Look at this. Look at this distinguished young lady. Um, yeah, we always encourage a slow introduction with any new pet in any new household, with new family members, other pets. Um, yeah, so and easy is the name of the name of the game. All right. Last time we had you on, we talked about the auction. Give us an update. Yes. Well, the auction is now live. Yes. You can visit our website, uh, thehumanesociety.org, to <laughs> to bid on some really wonderful experiences and items. Um, and all of that money goes toward the care for animals like Greta and all of her friends at the shelter. So again, that's the humanesociety.org start bidding on the auction items and pick out a new forever friend. I think that Greta is ready to go. So I'll say goodbye <laughs> to you, Miss Lauren. Thank and I'll you see so you much. next week for our next pet of the Sounds week. Sounds like a plan. Thank All you. All right. With me now are two individuals to talk about Domestic Violence Action Month. We're talking about the YWCA of Pierce County. Please join me in welcoming Karen White. You are CEO, Deputy Director, kind of doing both still yeah. because you can, of the YWCA. Welcome back to City Line, my dear. Thanks, Amanda. It's good to have you here. Thanks. This fabulous person, Jesse Bolin. Jesse, you are the Fund Development Manager for the YWCA for Pierce County. Welcome to City Line. Thank you. Good to have you here. All right. So, Karen, I always like to start with understanding the history of this month, but even bigger, the history of the why. And, and um, tell us about the why and how long it's been here in Tacoma. Sure. So the YWCA first came to Tacoma in 1906, so we've been around for a long time. Wow! Um, so it started out, as many YWCAs did, as a sort of social and fitness um, and also um, residence lodge for women back at times when women couldn't access those things in other locations. So um, the building we're in now, we occupied in 1927. It was built as a YWCA and had um, social programs for girls, there was USO dances there during World War II. Um, there has been lots of different kinds of programming, but it was in the mid 70s on the heels of the women's rights movement that the YWCA really shifted their focus to social services and particularly supporting survivors of domestic violence. So we actually opened one of the first domestic violence shelters in the state of Washington wow. back in 1976, and we've been doing that program ever since. And it was in the early 2000s that we really um, realized that a lot of things we were doing, other nonprofits had come up in Tacoma who could do those things better and in a more focused way. So we kind of peeled off any of the programming we had that was not related to serving survivors of domestic violence. And now that is our sole focus. So all of our programming 
shelter, housing, legal services, counseling, support groups, therapeutic children's program, prevention and education is all focused on addressing um, intimate partner violence and helping to prevent it in the future. Oh, beautifully said. So Jesse, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So you, I know that the YWCA has some activities to raise awareness, but also encourage people to take action. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what they are, Jesse? Yeah, so this month we hosted our Lean Into Action Breakfast, as well as last night we had a film screening around reproductive access and how mm. that overlaps with the experience of intimate partner violence. Um, and then next week on Tuesday, we're going to be having a book discussion, a partnership with the Tacoma Public Libraries, uh, talking about the book Mate uh, by Stephanie Landis, and really discussing, you know, what does intimate partner violence look like in our community and how can we support survivors? Wow, that's impressive. So you mentioned that you have an associate board. Mm -hmm. um, I caught that in that sponsoring your upcoming film screen and book club. So who who are or who is the associate board and what is their role for the YWCA? Yeah, so the associate board was created in 2015 to provide space for folks who traditionally are not represented in philanthropy. So younger people, people from marginalized communities. And so our associate board is made up of folks who maybe you wouldn't traditionally see on a board of directors and that kind of thing in the nonprofit sphere. And they operate as our outreach arm for the YWCA. Oh. They, so they host book clubs and film screenings, as well as things like outreach events at festivals and fairs. Um, so we really try to support them in encouraging folks uh, to get engaged in our community and, and support the survivors in their lives. Um, so they're, they're a wonderful group of folks and continue to host a lot of great events for us. Oh, it sounds like it. Why did you choose MAID? So MADE is a really great representation of the experience of intimate partner violence. It shows all the complexities and the reality that there is no perfect survivor, right? Mm. Uh, we often hear that narrative working in this field that in order to get help, you have to be this kind of representation of someone who experience violence in a very certain way. Um, but MADE represents what it's like to truly be a survivor in this world and all the complexities that exist with oh, it. Wow, well, very well said. So Karen, when I think about October is Domestic Violence Action Month, then I think right around the corner is the holidays and that brings its own um, awareness that we need to keep in mind. So tell us for October, um, as we head into this October season, um, and we have clients that you're still serving mm -hmm. in this month and of course beyond, um, what kind of services first off do we offer and then how does that change as we get into more of the winter season? So all of our services are ongoing and um, we really have uh, different ways that people can access our services. So we do have some drop-in hours for folks who want to talk to a community advocate. We also have um, a 24-7 domestic violence hotline that people can call and talk to a trained advocate. And, and it doesn't have to be the survivor that calls. It could mm. be a friend or family member who's concerned about someone and just wants information of how they can be helpful or supportive. Um, but also that's a way to begin to access uh, an intake for our shelter program. Um, shelter uh, across the board in our community is difficult because yeah. of the houseless crisis and also um, our shelter is specific for survivors of intimate partner violence. So we do have to take people with the highest need for safety. Um, and so there's a process for that. But our services are ongoing and then as we head into the fall, we start gearing up for the holidays and everything that goes with that. We want our families to have really anything that you or I would want to experience in the yes. holidays. We don't settle for good enough. We want people to have experiences that are normalizing, that are supportive, that impart worth and dignity. So um, we are gearing up now with our wonderful associate board. Um, and we have partnered many years with Feed 253 to provide holiday oh. meals around the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, and then we have a whole process that we do for um, December holidays, uh, where we support clients through, um, we used to do this huge, massive toy drive and we had all this product. I remember that. And it took a lot of staff time and a lot of space. Yes. And it was pretty hectic. In the pandemic, we had to shift because we couldn't do that. So we, we now do what we call our Holly Jolly program, which is a gift card drive. 
Um, it's very efficient in terms of the logistics. I bet. Which is fantastic. But also what it really does, it empowers people to have the resources to go get the things that they know specifically their child wants or their children yeah. want. So it's a way um, to help um, our clients that we serve really have that empowerment to experience the holiday season in the way that they choose to do that. And That's so right. uh, we actually have had such success with that that we're never going back to the other way of doing it. We, this is I really a great way that. to do it. I love that proclamation. Yeah. We're never going back to the way we used to. Yeah. And that's part of working smart, not hard. Yeah. Um, that, that happens. When we think about um, the unhoused situation, mm -hmm. how does that affect the why as a whole in terms of what you can do and, and the load you have to carry? You know, when I first started in this field a very long time ago, mostly we had folks coming for services who had just fled their primary residence. Um, over the years, that has changed a lot. So we do have folks coming seeking shelter who have been unhoused, who have been sofa surfing, who've been living in their cars, um, maybe who fled from another state um, mm. for safety reasons. And so the needs that folks have when they arrive are more substantial, both in terms of um, kind of the tangible things that they need to be set up, um, but also the impact that trauma has and having a longer period of crisis uh, because of the lack of affordable housing and also just um, when survivors flee frequently, they have to leave their employment because they're no longer able to be safe there or they need to relocate and things of that nature. So um, we have community advocates that can meet with folks who are not seeking our particular shelter or maybe ha found shelter but need other types of support. They might need safety planning. Uh, they might just need information. And then we also have, you know, the other litany of services. But for folks who are unhoused, it becomes really difficult yeah. because there's their original safety issue of domestic violence, but it's also very unsafe to be unhoused. Mm -hmm. um, there's layers of trauma that come Oof. with that. And so... We do have a counseling program as well that when folks are ready to access that, it's no charge, but it allows people to get a longer term, sort of deeper dose of intervention to help with understanding trauma and creating coping mechanisms for that and building resilience. Um, but much like every social service and shelter provider in the community, our shelter's mostly full and we yes. do have a pretty long waiting list. Um, so. We're doing everything that we can, and we partner with the um, Coalition to End Homelessness to try and, and connect people to all the litany of resources that are available in the community, uh, and then support um, things that we can during the colder months. Absolutely. I know that in February, uh, you, we are gonna talk about teen dating violence. Um, and Jesse, can you give us a preview? Because as I said to you in the green room, when my child was in school, I was so busy trying to keep up with just the schoolness, I would have not known what to look for. Leave mm -hmm. us with some tidbits here, Jesse. What should we be looking for? Mm, yeah. So one of the things that we've seen really increasing with teen dating violence is the use of digital abuse. Um, so a lot of the times, some of our youth advocates have shared with me that when they go into schools and they're talking to kids about their experience about abuse, um, these kids will be like, oh, I didn't know I sh shouldn't give people the passwords to oh. my social media. Um, or those kinds of things. And so it's so easy now for teens to provide other teens their location access, information about their text messages, their social media. So really educating your youth about how they should be smart around digital access and who should have access to their digital profiles online, because so many of those things now can be used as a method for control. Absolutely. Well, yes. And I remember very clearly during COVID, the YWCA got around that control issue with having little um, pieces of paper that people inside Safeway could pull mm -hmm. and call. Um, so there's always, it always seems like you are on the cutting edge of helping people understand how to protect themselves. I want to say thank you to you both of you and your team that we couldn't get on the couch because the comfy couch can only hold so much. For all that you do, I look forward to having you back on the couch in February so we can talk more in depth about this. Deal? 
Yeah. Deal. All right. We have much more to come on City Line. Don't go away. We'll be right back.